Great. Thank you, Kyle. And uh, thank you, everybody, for, for coming tonight, um, especially on such short notice. I'm very excited about this discussion. I think we have a lot to uh, to kind of get to and really want to really want to just like kick it off real fast. So uh, let's start with some brief intros. Um, kick it off to you, Morgan, first. Uh, if you can give an intro of yourself and kind of, uh, you know, a little bit for the crowd here. Sure. Uh, Hey, guys. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm Morgan Krupetsky. I lead out the institutional vertical uh, for the business development team at Ava Labs. I joined about six months ago um, and have been having a blast. Um, I joined from the traditional finance world uh, where I worked for 12 years um, in a variety of different roles and kind of in my role here, really working to bridge the gap between the TradFi world and all things Web3, blockchain, digital assets. Um, so uh, speaking with a variety of different institutions from big banks, asset managers, private equity funds, family offices, crypto native funds, and kind of everything in between. So really excited to be here and, uh, and to dive in. Great. Thank you, Morgan. Um, it's been a delight having you uh, so far. And we worked together back at City for a little bit. And, uh, and Nahas, John Nahas, let's, uh, let's hear from you, a little introduction. <laughs> Thanks, Luigi. Uh, good to be here and good to see everyone from the community come out. Uh, so John Nahas, Vice President of Business Development, uh, oversee the BD team across all six of the verticals that we, that we take on uh, to grow the Avalanche ecosystem. Uh, been with Ava Labs since September 2020, so a little bit before mainnet launch. Uh, Got into crypto like in 2017. I realized that I don't like to sleep much and I like doing fun stuff. So got red pilled before before Avalanche went live and it's been quite a ride for the past two years, especially with all you guys on this call and, and doing all the fun stuff that we're doing. Great. Thanks, John. And then Ed, Ed Chang. Let's, get a, let's hear about you. Hey, everyone. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I lead our gaming vertical within BD. Been here since December. Uh, before this, spent over a decade in the traditional gaming industry, the Web2 gaming industry. Um, was at EA for about five years before this, leading strategy for our esports group. Fun fact that maybe not a lot of people know is my journey into working at Ava Lab started with a cold email to John Wu, our president. So don't let your dreams be dreams. <laughs> yes, yes. One of my favorite stories. Uh... <laughs> Uh, Kevin Sicknicki. Nice, nice spam will just explode right now. Oh, no. Good email. <laughs> Rest in peace. Uh, it's all good. It's all good. I, I love it all. Yeah. Send it on. We have you, Goon. So let's get an introduction from you. Uh, I'm not sure how many people need it, but. Oh, sure. Um, it's Emin and Sir here. I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a scientist first and foremost. I um, was doing blockchains back in 2002. And uh, I've been working in the space uh, just all across. And, uh, uh, but the thing that I pride myself, and I, I did work also as a professor for about 20 years or so at Cornell University. The thing that I really pride myself on, though, is my ability to hang out with really, really smart and really, really nice people. So, uh, so thank you all for coming. I think this group over here, and I, by that I mean everybody in the audience, uh, is just wonderful. So thank you. Thank you, Gun. And then uh, Kevin, Mr. Seknicki. Uh, let's hear a little bit about how we ended up being stuck with you tonight. Yes, uh, that is a good question. Uh, I've been in this uh, space for a very long time, long enough that uh, even though my driver's license says that I'm pretty young, I feel uh, extremely old. This space has uh, <laughs> driven me down, uh, but it's very exciting to be here. Uh, it's uh, It's been quite a ride. Uh, I, I started off uh, actually doing research back in, in college uh, on some of the stuff in uh, like super early on, then went on to graduate school and uh, uh, and actually got uh, to meet uh, Emin, uh, where we did a bunch of research together. Um, and I've uh, just been in the space for uh, from the very beginning on on the research days and down to the point where uh, I try to still do a little bit of uh, engineering work, but uh, not so much these days. Although you know, Twitter is uh, my shit posting on Twitter does take a lot of time, so I have to <laughs> put take some time there but uh, it's just gotten to the point where it's incredible to see this community get, getting so big and i'm frankly surrounded by peter people people far better than me uh working in this space so it's, it's just really exciting to be in this ecosystem right now 
Thank you, Kevin. And then real quick uh, for myself. So I also uh, worked in TradFi for about six or seven years as a trader. I traded credit derivatives and interest rate derivatives and um, really uh, joined blockchain while I was sitting on that desk. Uh, I, I ended up buying some Bitcoins and uh, and subsequently sold them when Apple Pay came out. Totally misunderstanding the thesis. And but that really started my uh, my really journey in crypto and, and got really involved and excited in the ICOs and, and the Ethereum space and you know, and, and inevitably DeFi was something that really attracted me given given kind of my background. So don't don't want to waste any more time, want to hop into it. But uh, we're here for we're here today to talk about um, enterprises and avalanche subnets. Now, I think this is a pretty important discussion. Uh, I really wanted to frame the the, um, you know, just to say up front, none of this is financial advice. Everything here is, is simply uh, a discussion on what we know and kind of just giving a little bit of insight into the community. Um, and with that said, I also wanted to frame the discussion in terms of, you know, recently a partner was asking me some questions about Avalanche. And um, every once in a while I go back and I, and, I, and I go read the initial white paper. And I think this is pretty important because that's when you can really go see, like, what was this project aiming to be? you know, when it really got started off. So I want to read one quick excerpt from that paper because I think it's important in framing this specific discussion and then get into um, a bunch of topics, including tech and also some of the BD uh, as it relates to enterprises. So I'm just going to read this real quick. So Avalanche platform is ideal for building application-specific blockchains, spanning permission and permissionless deployments, subnetworks, or a subnet is a dynamic set of validators working together to achieve consensus on the state of set blockchains. One can create a subnet where each validator has certain properties. For example, one could create a subnet where each validator is located in a certain jurisdiction or where each validator is bound by some real world contract. Now, this is like just a very random excerpt that I took, but I think it's important because a lot of the use cases and um, in particular, a lot of the, the reason people are excited about subnets are these exact points that were illustrated uh, some three uh, three years ago or so. And I think that's important because it was always the same mission. And um, with that said, um, there are some really exciting technical updates with respect to subnets that will enable everything that we're talking about with respect to enterprises. So Kevin and, 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 and Goon, you know, and both of you guys, can you, can you, talk a little bit about, I'll start with you, Kevin, talk a little bit about the, the recent BAMF upgrade in particular and, and kind of what this enables uh, and particularly why this is important as it relates to uh, number one enterprises, but also just uh, uh, subnet adoption going forward. Right. So um, the, I mean, BAMF is important because it's a stepping stone into uh, what has now been a, a long journey towards uh, ratifying the the, the full uh, subnet architecture. And uh, Banff is not, uh, uh, the, the current release on Banff is actually just one of the stepping stones uh, towards uh, all of the things that we would want to achieve uh, to, to really get to, uh, to full maturity with subnets. Uh, but it's an important one and it opens up a lot of, uh, uh, you know, basically it's a lot of code changes that are required in order for us to get to the next phase uh, of, uh, of subnet deployment, which is particularly speaking, full permissionless subnets uh, with C-chain token support. And that's an incredibly important step because at that point is when we can actually really start opening up uh, subnets uh, to the world in a way that is fully permissionless with any token deployed uh, on, on uh, the, the primary subnets and um, obviously, that's that's a, that's a whole game changer at that point. Um, there is also other very key code changes uh, and to Banff um, that, if you actually took a look at the uh, at the source code, uh, you'll see there is a lot of uh, these uh, little uh, you know uh, breadcrumbs all around uh, as they pertain to BLS signatures, and that's because it's the the first step towards opening up uh, the cross the communication work that has been underway for a long time. It's still a lot of work that uh, I'm sure uh, uh, will become uh, uh, much more widely discussed on Twitter uh, uh, sometime in the future. Um, but it's it's a critical uh, a step that will open up cross the communication um, in a way that is pretty different from other solutions. In fact, it's, I would say, probably the most efficient solution that I know of 
uh, for for cross chain communication out there in the space. So um, Banff One, uh, this first release is is pretty much a lot of code changes that are required for getting to full cross subnet communication and full permissionless subnets in the in the near future. So uh, let me kind of wrap up what uh, what uh, what Kevin alluded to. So. Um, as of this moment, with Banff, what you can do on Avalanche is as follows. Avalanche is not just a single chain. It's not just three chains. It is a giant umbrella under which anyone can deploy their blockchain. There are many chains on uh, underneath uh, the Avalanche umbrella. I lost count, by the way. And if I include the subnet, it's more than uh, more than 100 and something or another, uh, even as we speak. If I include the sorry, if I include the test net, it's more than 100 and something. So, um, so we give you the ability to create your own blockchain according to your own rules. We give you the ability to define your own validators, and that turns out to be a critical ability for dealing with extra contractual, you know, things that you cannot express in code, uh, and that's that's very very important for some institutional use cases that I'm sure we're going to touch upon. Uh, Ban gives you the ability to stake your own coins. So you can create your own coin. You could put it up on an AMM. It can be traded, etc. And it can also be used to 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 uh, for staking and securing your own subnet. You can use that very coin or any other coin, actually, if you want, as gas. So you can pay, do your gas payments. So your coin can have two additional use cases in addition to whatever else it does, according to the smart contract that defined it. And uh, in addition to all this, the uh, subnets can have their validators elastically change. So when you need to add more more nodes, you can. And uh, this is going to be very important. As you all know, the thing that binds us all is decentralization. And, uh, and, and I think there's going to be a day of reckoning when people realize that there's a lot of, you know, emperor and, and na naked emperors around. And someone's going to call it out that, uh, that a lot of the chains masquerading around are just centralized centralized, uh, uh, I don't want to finish that sentence, centralized things, let's just say. Um, so uh, let's see. So um, instead, with elastic subnets, you can have uh, subnets that grow, that get to be very, very large. And finally, as Kevin mentioned, uh, the, with Banff, we have the ability to, uh, or not the ability, but at the moment, there's no uh, API for it. But we have the underlying uh, sort of primitives for creating what we call quorum certificates using BLS signatures. So BLS signatures are a very efficient way to get, uh, get a group of nodes or a group of um, entities, cryptographic entities, to attest to a fact. And uh, they are the building block for trustless bridging. So there's a lot to be said about bridging. I've t touched upon this on my podcast. I'm not going to get into it. Uh, but, uh, but with this, you don't have to have any notion of additional trust in anything, anyone else. You can just trust the other subnet, and two subnets can bridge each other, uh, connect to each other uh, using the band primitives. So that's about the wrap up of what you can do concretely with the band release. And that for us opens up a lot of institutional use cases. Yes, thank you guys. That's, I think it's super helpful. Uh, a lot of people, um, you know, like you said, a lot of people have touched and used the Avalanche C chain, and, and in a lot of ways, they, they associate Avalanche with simply that chain. Um, but as I read with the initial with the initial excerpt from the beginning, this is very much the the architecture and design from the get go. And uh, in particular, enterprises was something when I was looking into Avalanche that you know, uh, Emin, you were talking a lot about, uh, especially with respect to permissioning of chains, uh, different jurisdictions of validators, uh, all the things that subnets enable, and kind of why this is going to be an important infrastructure as they look into uh, digitizing assets. So. I think we're, you know, we're kind of in a, in the sweet spot as it relates to the infrastructure, and and, and the tech in particular. Um, wanted to wanted to pivot a little bit and, and start to talk a little bit about, uh, in particular, what we hear um, and kind of like some of the feedback we get. You know, I wanted to, to pivot to John uh, Nahas. John leads BD at Ava Labs, and in particular, uh, he works with a lot of the enterprises and has really a unique seat in terms of. The questions that they're asking, the things that they're looking into, uh, why they're considering subnets, and and particularly why why this could be a really strong infrastructure for them. So, John, do you mind just giving us a little bit of insight into kind of uh, why people are considering it, what types of uh, enterprises, and and why it's you know a strong layer of infrastructure if that's the case? Absolutely, Luigi. Thanks, and you know. 
I think uh, Emin and Kevin just did a fantastic job giving people kind of the technical background of what's capable, right? And what builders can do with subnets, particularly with enterprises, right? So when we talk to enterprises, the fact that uh, they can build their own chain, right? That they can have their own environment for their own application is a huge game changer for them, right? So think of subnets as app-specific chains or like our good friend at MasterCard, Harold Boss, who leads innovation, calls them business-specific chains, right? So if we were to take a step back, we've been hearing about enterprise blockchains for years now. But the problem is they fail to gain steam. They fail to gain steam, though, because they live in a vacuum. There's no developer community. There's no ecosystem. There's no, there's no users that can actually bring innovation to the forefront that allow an enterprise or, or a partner to build something and derive, you know, some innovations from DeFi, from other assets and bring things together into kind of a sandbox that allows them to do their application, right? What we've seen are single chains that are solutions in search of, in search of a problem, right? Like if you're a builder, you had to contort your application to fit within the parameters of the chain that was presented to you. Subnets flip that script on its head, right? You are telling the builder, here is the infrastructure layer for you to build your application and you can tailor the subnet or the, you know, your chain to fit your use case. You could choose the validators that, that, that you want. You could put the parameters that are set. You could set your fee structure to what you want it to be, right? So it really changes it to support the builder, to support the enterprise, right? To give you an example, if you look at in Web2, right, when people watch Netflix, they don't they don't see Netflix powered by AWS. They just know that AWS is there. It's the backbone that people build on, right? So with subnets, it's the backbone and the infrastructure for enterprises to build their applications, to build their use cases the best way they want. We are taking away the, the, the blockchain infrastructure, the headaches of managing it, the headaches of creating your own blockchain and really giving it to the builder to do whatever they want to do. And that opens up a ton of use cases that previously weren't there. Awesome. Uh, yeah, Morgan, I'm, I'm pivoting to you now. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I was just going to actually just add to that, Luigi, before you go on that, sure. you know, in, in echoing everything John just said, I think a big, big part of our role, whether on the institutional or the enterprise side, is education. And we've been doing a ton of education webinars, Twitter spaces, and just a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with different types of institutions and enterprises. And a lot of it is kind of opening their eyes to the world that there is like a world beyond their beyond enterprise specific blockchains um, and kind of enabling them to see that subnets really uh, kind of allow for the best of both uh, public permissionless chains and enterprise specific blockchains. So a lot of it just starts with education sessions like this that kind of go through what our vision is, what are the capabilities of subnets and do those capabilities and, and likely they do. Um, address address the specific use cases and needs for for different enterprise uh, use cases. Yeah, so so with that, let's let's start to get into some use cases um, that we that we we've announced and kind of like uh, that are that are being built and deployed or previously deployed. Uh, Morgan, you have uh, whether you call it a disadvantage or the advantage of uh, being in a much longer cycle as it relates to the the time it takes these things to get to market. Very different than like myself in DeFi, where people can, you know, like developers can code up a smart contracts and get their their app up and running in, you know, a few weeks or so. So it, it's totally different from that perspective and, and, and much more permission and compliance related. So let's talk. I, I wanted to start with Intain because I think it's a really interesting use case, especially as it relates to uh, financial markets. Can you give a little bit of insight into kind of what what this uh, use case is for for a subnet? Why a subnet's important for what they're doing, and and kind of what your your overall thoughts on why this is uh, this is exciting? Sure. So Intain uh, Intain Admin and Intain Markets um, they've been around for a handful of years now. They were originally building on Hyperledger and have, are actually kind of pivoting some of their um, infrastructure and and project onto an Avalanche subnet. I think the initial um, investment announcement came out earlier over the summer, and finally their their subnet um, is set to be rolled out soon, um, and will be the first kind of institutionally focused subnet, kind of made by and for institutions. Um, 
the initial kind of solution that they had rolled out was Intain Admin, which um, is definitely like the less sexy part of, of blockchain, but I almost feel like the most important and more powerful component as it relates to like financial services in that it's basically putting the asset back securities administration process on chain. Um, and so therefore using smart contracts enables a ton of operational and process efficiencies that those of us came, that came from kind of the world of traditional finance can really appreciate. Um, they're now pivoting to building out this subnet, which will is kind of like the part two of what they're building out, which is um, a tokenized marketplace for um, asset backed security trading. Um, we'll get into like, you know, the importance of bringing real world assets on chain. But I think a major kind of um, reason why they ended up going with the subnet construct is to some of the points that we were talking about earlier, where they have full control kind of end to end of of the user uh, and institutional experience. So for them, it was very important that they had um, uh, permissioning capabilities, that they had US hosted infrastructure, uh, making sure that all the data kind of resided within, within the US, making sure that they had full control over who the validators were, that they were all US entities or individuals, that they all passed KYC and AML checks. So all of these things that we talked about in terms of possibilities there, they saw and they're you know, capitalizing on and utilizing as it relates to their subnet. So I'll pause there, but i um, really excited about, about this one in particular. Yeah, no, that's helpful. I mean, I think one of the, uh, one of the things I, I always said is like uh, one of the greatest use cases for, for blockchain technology in particular is how, uh, you know, it's an unsexy use case, but is effectively, it's effectively, creating efficiencies in the operations of finance. And if you've ever worked into a large bulge bracket bank, you'll know that uh, those things are quite inefficient and it's going to be pretty hard to upgrade the tech. So uh, I think that that's going to come from the outside and pretty, pretty pumped up about that. And I think Intain is a great, great example of, of kind of a, you know, a perfect use case for a sub. I think, uh, I think inefficient is a euphemism for what sometimes that frustration <laughs> is. So fully appreciate that. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we both know that. Um, so, so John, uh, you know, one other use case that was previously announced was RE, uh, RE. You know, I think you have a lot of uh, a lot more context on why this is another you know exciting use case for for a subnet. And you know, I want to hear a little bit from you, like you know, why these guys chose um, or gals, why they chose the subnet, and why you know uh, an avalanche subnet was a great decision for them. Yeah, yeah, right. So in there, you got it. Go ahead, Morgan. You can. You can. <laughs> Sir, this I'm is just your thing. Over Mor the Morgan's feeling the fire. Get in there. Let's go, Morgan. <laughs> well, so this is interesting, and I think well, there's there's different kind of use cases and and projects and protocols deploying on their own subnet, others that are just deploying on the C chain, and others that are kind of deploying on a hybrid model, just depending on their specific needs. So I think in the re case. Um, they're basically uh, employing this this hybrid model um, at a high level. What they are, and this was um, announced uh, a, a few a few weeks ago. But essentially, they're building a globally decentralized reinsurance marketplace on Avalanche. So it's a fully collateralized protocol. It's tokenizing reinsurance. It'll allow accredited investors to provide backing for real world insurance policies and companies. And essentially, basically, investors can go in and select what type of insurance premium they'd like to underwrite. It'll provide them with a yield that is totally uncorrelated from macro markets, from DeFi yields, from other assets. And on the other side, insurers seeking reinsurance can kind of tap into greater sources of liquidity and capital beyond the same standard set of options in the traditional finance world that, you know, at this point, they're kind of currently limited to. So again, we can kind of go into the importance of bringing real world assets on chain, but as it relates to their kind of subnet strategy, again, they're kind of employing a, a hybrid approach where their primary protocol will live on the C chain, but will be calling information that's stored on a subnet. And the subnet will be essentially used to kind of warehouse private data about claims, written policies, PII, um, anything that would typically be held in a private database. Um, but they basically allows, um, you know, a transparent single source proof of record on a need to know basis. And so the two components will be separated again on C-Chain and a subnet, um, but underlying this or underpinning this uh, use case and the needs 
are the under like the sharing the same underlying network, the same tooling, the same base layer, which obviously allows for kind of greater connectivity as needed and interoperability as needed. So at a high level, I think we work really closely with institutions and enterprises to determine what is the best fit for them. Like a subnet isn't necessarily optimal for all use cases, but you know, we really work to kind of ensure that the use case meet, is met with the optimal solution from a subnet hybrid or, or C chain perspective. Luigi, I want to jump in and add, and add something, right? So Morgan just highlighted something that's super, super important, right? She highlighted that they're using part of their application on C-Chain and the rest in a subnet, which again, allows the builder to have the flexibility to create the parameters that they want to fit their business case, to fit their application need, right? Anyone who's worked in a major enterprise or a major financial institution knows how siloed different parts of these businesses are, how there's no interoperability within the same company, how one division doesn't talk to the other. This is solving that at a base layer by allowing different parts of an application or different data sets to have uh, communication and connectivity. But more important than all of that, too, right, you have an institution here that has some sensitive data. They don't want people's information or people's claims to be public. They don't want it to be on the C-chain alongside an NFT mint or a DeFi transaction. They want that cordoned off. They want that private, but they want the rest to be public. So you're at, you're just opening up these hybrid models, the, the, the ability to really connect and create interoperability on the communication layer, on the value transfer layer, to whatever the, the need may be. But I want to turn it back to you, Luigi, real quick, right? You're, you're the guy who sits in DeFi and you sit on the, on the innovation side. Like from your perspective, right, where are you seeing the innovation on the DeFi side that is driving the enterprises? and the institutions to adapt, right? To, to move forward and, and to move into this new world. Oh man. Um, yeah, so I, I think in a lot of ways, um, uh, DeFi is in particular like the building blocks to finally upgrade financial market infrastructure. So I do think there's gonna become a point in time where DeFi and a lot of these institutional efforts uh, c kind of collide in a way that that is pretty, I think, um, uh, can, can result in an actual innovation. There's no way, like I said before, that this innovation is going to come from within. Uh, there's no way you're going to be able to upgrade bank infrastructures uh, to handle atomic uh, transactions, to handle digitized assets, to handle uh, the ability to kind of uh, fractionalize some of these, these complex derivatives. So this is not going to happen from within, and it's going to take something, you know, incredibly innovative, and also, uh, in a lot of ways, there's some there's some regulatory arbitrage that 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 comes into play with respect to DeFi. And I think, in particular, the one thing that won't be compromised as this kind of gets to gets to uh, the institutions is is the legality of everything. And because of that, the subnet infrastructure is super important. And uh, but with that said, like I do want to hit, I do want to hit home this this last point on. Uh, financial institutions. Uh, we talked a little bit about Intain and Re, which are two great use cases. Um, you know, Emin, you've talked a lot about um, sort of these these real world assets and kind of the abilities they can bring with respect to collaterals uh, in the market. And I think you're pretty prescient on this for a long time. Can you can you kind of give us an idea of why you from the beginning thought this was an important um, uh, infrastructure and and kind of like why uh, you know, this, this could really, you know, sort of bring some more innovations. Sure. Um, I think if we step, if we take a step back and look at what's happened in the space, uh, we see that a lot of the growth has been driven by crypto assets and has been relegated to the crypto community. So it has been very inward oriented. And much as I love DeFi, it, it really hasn't been able to uh, to reach massive adoption at a scale that that I would I would be happy with. I think we're on in the in the very earliest of days of DeFi adoption, and um, and so of the of the trillions of dollars lacked up in uh, in world's assets, only a tiny fraction, one seven hundred actually, is in crypto, and uh, so there is a lot of value out there that is begging to be to be used as conveniently, as nicely, as democratically as all of our other assets that exist on chain. So when we started this whole project, one of our main goals was that uh, we need to build infrastructure that is fast enough, scalable enough, 
that is uh, flexible enough to accommodate all of these assets. So, um, so that's what got us started. I'm really, really excited about some of the, the things that happened recently, uh, like the KKR collaboration, uh, where, where uh, KKR with Securitize has started issuing their um, uh, shares of, of their big healthcare fund on, uh, on chain. So uh, it's an amazing accomplishment. So this is, uh, you know, now, now these, these, these assets are available to anyone anywhere on earth. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, uh, it's just that flat structure that we're all familiar with. And, uh, and that, in turn, opens up a lot of other opportunities. It's going to take a bit, a bit of a step function, right? You, you get these assets, and maybe the first asset you get, okay, like everybody who looks at it, they don't even understand. They might not know what KKR is. They might not know that these people have $500 billion worth of assets to manage. Um, but uh, soon enough, at some point, you cross a threshold where suddenly you have enough valuable assets that are decorrelated that you can suddenly have an algorithmic stablecoin that is actually not reflexive, not kind of inward oriented, not, not prone to runs, etc. So we can start to build, bring or merge some of the technologies we built in blockchains with other sources of value external, on cha- external off-chain. So um, these are these are the types of things that, that get me really really excited. Yeah, I think I think that's really um, that really goes to the the point of DeFi intersecting with uh, sort of a lot of these institutional on chain uh, endeavors. You know, like the ability to use something like an Aave or a Banky, uh, you know, as as the actual infrastructure and smart contracts to store your various security tokens as collateral is. You know, is is this is in in effect the way these two, uh, you know, parts of the business uh, intersect? And I'm I'm pretty excited about sort of the financialization and, and efficiencies that'll create uh, for capital markets. Um, Want to turn gears here a little bit? Uh, enterprises can really it's a pretty broad word, but you know, we've sort of and, and Avalanche in particular has had a lot of success as it relates to gaming and blockchain gaming is something that a lot of people are excited about, and I think rightly so. It's a, it's, it's a use case that makes a lot of sense, but we have we have an expert here as it relates to Ed Chang, who kind of um, has spent a lot of time in gaming and has spent a lot of time talking to a lot of these gaming institutions and and why uh, subnets might be interesting to them. So Ed, you know, there have been a number of announcements. Uh, last week we you know uh, we announced GRI, which you can shed some light on, but there's also been Shrapnel, uh, I think Dami Online, Ascenders. There's there's many ones. Can you kind of give us a lay of the land? Uh, explain the GREE announcement and also explain kind of uh, why a subnet is perfect for uh, for gaming and if that's the feedback you're getting back from a lot of these um, gaming yeah. companies. Sounds good. So so everybody on this this, this space probably saw the, the big GREE announcement last week. But if you have it, you know, GREE is a Japanese gaming publisher powerhouse. They've got, you know, a 20-year history of producing some of the world's biggest games um, we got introduced to them about seven months ago, and we instantly just really vibed. They, you know, I think they appreciated a few aspects. Number one, that you know we had a level of gaming competency and cared about these traditional gaming values, where we we were we we, we dove into the gameplay, you know, first at, at times. And the second was from a technical perspective, where we were very no BS, um, laid it out in terms of the tech, um, showed how we were the farthest ahead technically, but also looking forward had some of the highest growth potential in terms of how we scale and, and some of the features coming down the pipe. Um, and so, you know, la- fast forward to last week, uh, we announced this partnership and, and they're not just partners from like an announcement standpoint, right? They're putting their money where their mouth is. They're investing into validators. Um, they uh, are looking to um, validate on behalf of multiple gaming subnets moving forward. Um, it's really a huge signal for subnets moving forward as a as a viable tool for business. Um, they're also building uh, multiple Web3 specific games that they have in the works. And um, we have talked to a lot of these different gaming platforms and service. You know, it's almost a cliche of, of the steam of Web3. But really to build that, um, you need two equally difficult things. Like number one is the tech, which subnets help solve and, and things that we're building out. And the second biggest thing is really the IP and bringing the eyeballs, which which GRI helps solve, right? They've 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 uh, built games around One Punch Man and Naruto and other timeless IP. So, um, you know, in a nutshell, that's kind of how the GRI announcement came about. But really, you know, why gaming publishers are also so excited on top of the reasons I mentioned is, 
you know, when you are playing a game, especially if you're used to playing web two games, you need when you transact, when you buy an item, when you earn something, you need that to be in your account instantly, right? And so um, running into block reorgs or uh, taking a while for finality of a transaction, that's just that's just a massive pain point and a non-starter for a lot of these um, web two normies that this may be their first experience in blockchain. So um, our games are extremely excited about that, the scalability, um, the ability to use you know the the game token as the gas token and across the marketplace. Um, the possibilities are endless there, and we're really working with some of our games as the first subnets to kind of unlock that and 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 really figure out the best way to handhold like the next generation of Web3 devs into subnets. So, um, you know, you mentioned some of them like AAA titles like Shrapnel. Um, we've got Pocket Worlds, which is like a, a, a Web2 metaverse that currently has 3 million MAUs. We've got Pulsar, you know, a, a Web3 MMO real-time strategy game. You know, the, the, the chicken team who we, we absolutely love here, they just announced their own subnet coming up. And of course, we've got DFK and Krabata, who are the first kind of gaming subnets out there. So the possibilities possibilities are endless, and we've got a ton more gaming subnets coming that, that we're really excited to announce in the next few months. Awesome, Ed. Yeah, uh, it's, been, it's been really exciting to see the progress there. Um, you know, I could say for myself that uh, I, I've heard great feedback as it relates to kind of um, you know, in particular DFK and their experience with, with learning how to use the subnet and being able to kind of manage that infrastructure on their own. It's been really like, you know, a pleasure to see, frankly. So uh, excited about seeing seeing those applications take that in their own hands. Want to leave some room for questions, but but before we do that, I uh, would love to just kind of um, um, back up a little bit. Uh, so, so the last thing I want to just talk about very quickly is that, you know, we talked a lot about permissioning of blockchains and uh, enterprise and, and all these things. But I think one thing that uh, Avalanche subnets in particular have that is quite unique is this, uh, how low level the, the protocol is, you know, how customizable it is. And I think it's an overlooked, um, you know, feature, because in a lot of ways, when you have, have an enterprise that's going to fully commit to a type of infrastructure, they will be willing to invest a ton of resources, right? They so when, when I say that, what I mean is they will be able to innovate on the, the virtual machine. Uh, they will be able to kind of write their own custom VM. So, Kevin, you know, why don't you talk a little bit about, you know, briefly, uh, you know, some of the some of the various different virtual machines and subnets that we do have and, and kind of like, you know, why why Avalanche enables this and why you think it's actually exciting? Oh, man. Um, so. I mean, first and foremost, it's uh, it comes down to just the the infrastructure being this giant open canvas that you can fully customize all the way to pretty much everything above the consensus layer. Um, th that means the virtual machine. That means the validator set. That means the tokenomics of it. Everything is customizable. So when that happens, uh, and you have readability, writability, you have controllability, which is the the, the last missing piece. And that's something that other um, uh, chains and ecosystems do not. Then uh, experimentation can happen at like insane paces. Obviously, we're still in the infancy of the technology being developed, but totally expect a whole bunch of really cool experiments to happen. Examples, um, for example, zk's being used at scale uh, to provide privacy technology, which is originally what they were actually built for and meant for, um, instead for scalability. So a subnet where you can do uh, controlled privacy transactions. Um, that's something that has not taken a, a, a hold of yet uh, because there is too much concerns over, you know, kind of more like permissionless versions of these of these technologies like Zcash. But in something in a, in a subnet with ZK technology built into it, now you can actually have a fully uh, uh, non, uh, non sorry fully self custodial way to have privacy for your uh, uh, for your uh, assets. Um, other things include, for example, complete transfer, retransforming uh, of, uh, of current existing file storage systems, right? You can build a subnet that has incredibly fast performance, but provides only something like a key value store. So we can re-implement IPFS entirely from scratch. Uh, in a way that that is far more resilient than the current IPFS, um, and and I, I can totally see this uh, 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 you know 
kind of going wild because there's a lot of problems with the current IPFS. Actually, there has been probably uh, many instances where IPFS links no longer work and so on. And so basically imagine a, a new subnet where you are guaranteed that those links uh, uh, will in fact store your data um, and they can actually perform at very high capacities. Uh, and there's a lot more, right? Like there is uh, things like, for example, fully homomorphic contracts, which are uh, which are incredibly complex to get done. Uh, and it, they're, they go far beyond even ZKs. But that's something that can totally happen because you get this customizability down to the VM layer. Um, I can see new kinds of VMs being experimented um, on the fly uh, that use uh, much more sophisticated uh, parallel processing than uh, even the latest things like Move, which are actually not that parallelizable. Um, so, you know, there's just so many things that you can kind of rattle off. Um, and and just the, it's just an open canvas. And like this experimentation has not happened yet. Uh, uh, but I, I could totally see it happening over the next couple of years. Yeah, I want to riff off of this a little bit, Kevin. You, you, you nailed it on this one. So uh, there's so much you can do with Avalanche because it is so low level. So I, I, I don't expect most of the people to follow what I'm about to say, but, but it is very important. There are many, many, many other chains out there that essentially uh, force you into centralized channels because it helps their either their whatever it is their narrative either their economics or their security model and um, uh, in avalanche there are no such artificial limits we do not force you to have to go through a central chain we do not force you to have to share a certain given set of validators etc cetera, etc cetera. so you really have full flexibility so um, this is something that's sort of ingrained and uh, we want to empower the developers who build up on us. So now what can you do with this? You can do anything uh, that distributed systems do and uh, using this, this architecture. Now, let me give you some examples and then let me wrap up by saying why that's actually a good idea as opposed to rolling your own. So um, one of the things you can do is you can use the consensus layer for group membership. So your subnet validators are essentially members of a group. So you want to deploy some kind of a distributed system, whether it's a game, whether it is a set of game servers, it's a set of mail servers, it's a set of what, you know, Mastodon servers, it's uh, yet another Twitter clone, whatever it might be, another social network perhaps, or a data availability layer of the kind that, uh, that uh, Kevin alluded to, a content addressable network where, you know, NFT data lives, for example. All of these are incredibly easy to do with subnets. And in fact, you don't have to, I mean, if you want to see some of this in action, uh, you don't have to take my word for it. Just go take a look at, at uh, Spaces VM. So I think if you Google for Spaces VM Avalanche, uh, you will find, uh, you know, at least after a few clicks, the, the actual thing. And it's on, uh, it's on the Fuji testnet. And it's kind of like a social network and it's kind of like a data storage uh, service. So that's one example, but there are many others. As Kevin mentioned, you can have uh, zero knowledge proofs inside your subnet. Uh, we developed, I actually partially wrote code for this. Uh, we have a Wasm VM. Uh, we never deployed it because uh, the Wasm, Wasm community is, is not that big or was not that big at the time. And I, I still don't think that there is anything unique there. But if that changes, we, are, we're, we would be very happy to deploy a Wasm VM, a Move VM if you wanted to do it, sure. But there are many other better things that are possible. So we can change the virtual machines um, or you can have no virtual machine, as I said, if you just use it for group membership. So these are all incredibly flexible. And the last thing I want to leave you with is, this is also very different. I mean, I know I'm gonna get this question. It's very different from the L2 vision. L2 vision just says, I'm gonna give you a single chain. You do whatever you want on top. We also do that. You know, you can do whatever you want on top of the C chain or whatever chain, you know, it's, it's or the X chain even. So um, that's fine, uh, but that's, that's a discombobulated world. Imagine, like, take that vision to its completion. Then you've got the underlying thing, and then you've got like a whole bunch of things on top and then some of them are on A chain and some of them are on the B chain and then A and B are, don't talk to each other, etc. Whereas if, if things are subnets, then there's a unifying construct. There is a framework in which they all fit. It's a, it's a coherent whole and these things can communicate with each other because they share some, uh, some crux of, a, of an interoperability layer. So I want to leave with that, right. this vision. We tried to, to, to articulate, but I think this, uh, this space has really got us to, to say it out loud very clearly. Yeah, we got. Uh, I think we got uh, Emmons cold to go away and got excited, and uh, and uh, felt that through there. So that's exciting to see. 
<laughs> no, it's the cold is here. The cold is here. I'm 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 hopped up on Dayquil up the wazoo. Avalanche creates cold. Okay, so uh, want to leave some room for questions here. Uh, no, we went a little bit over, but I think everybody can stay for a little bit and make sure we we afford the community some questions. So, uh, want to start with uh, Amro. I think it brought you up stage. Um, you should be able to hit the mic and and ask a question. Please direct. Uh, the question to who you want to ask and and keep it on topic please um just as, that's one thing i'm going to ask of everybody um you know we have a very specific uh, agenda here today as it relates to what we're discussing so let's just make sure we we kind of keep the questions on topic so go ahead amro absolutely and thank you everybody for your time and, and this has been such an informative space i think the people up here are just you know powerhouses and and to me, I think there's no no question about the dominance in terms of enterprise use uh, of, of blockchain technology. Uh, what I wanted to ask was really, you know, leveraging the power of subnets and the upcoming, you know, releases and interoperability, uh, moving beyond finance and gaming. When I think of enterprise, I think of, you know, non-financial use cases. I think of, you know, how AWS was able to capture such huge market share by, you, you know, startups born on AWS. I see Avalanche kind of acting as that bridge from Web 2, Web 2.5 to Web 3. Uh, I, I think that's how tremendous growth and adoption and, and mass use can happen. I wanted to ask kind of the team collectively, uh, whoever wants to answer, um, how you see this unfolding uh, beyond the financial you know, and, and gaming applications. I'll jump in here and, and, and take a stab at this. I mean, from from what we're seeing from partners that we're talking to that are kind of throwing out ideas or people looking to build stuff, right? You can, so put aside financial stuff, put aside um, things that we're used to, right? I think Kevin alluded to this. Um, you know, you could create a social network on a subnet. You can have it, a mobile application that is powered by an Avalanche subnet on the back end that you don't even know you're using. A blockchain right like that's that's the that's kind of where you go and i'll kind of throw this back out to you and to everybody else you know evan made a great comment he's like a lot of things that are being built for crypto are being built for crypto people right it's a very inward facing and i don't think any of us yet know what that killer app is going to be that takes crypto or blockchain technology to that mass adoption level right like what social media did for the internet and took it so mainstream it's not there yet. It's not there yet because the technology, I don't think, has been there yet to, to underpin and allow someone that's super innovative or some company that's innovative to build a new product that, that, that's outside of the box of what, what currently exists today. Whatever's being created today is something that already exists under the sun, but it's being done better or, or decentralized. So I'll, I'll say to you, we don't know. It could be loyalty. It could be membership. It could be DAOs. It could be a million different ways to organize people in a distributed, decentralized manner that we haven't even thought of yet, whether it's you know, information, membership, a million different things. So. Thank you. Yeah. Well, well, one, one, thing, one thing I want to add to this are the synergies. So um, I, I think we ended up focusing on just two topics, and I think that's why we got this question, and it's a very fair question. But uh, well, let's not forget, um, I mean, we alluded to these other things, right? Like a ZK layer of payments, payments now, private payments network, uh, these, uh, these VMless subnets, etc. But uh, the thing I want to talk about is synergies. Imagine that there is, a, there is a network out there, there's a subnet out there where you keep identity data. And, uh, and then suddenly you can actually start importing information from that network using perhaps a Z ZKP into other chains without having to duplicate that infrastructure. So the, suddenly, as we add more use cases, the utility of the overall thing will increase uh, immensely. Uh, Amazing. So, uh, uh, can, can I'm dying here, more... by the way, but so go ahead, Kevin. <laughs> I can <laughs> barely breathe today. <laughs> no, no, you're right. Yeah, take more NyQuil. Um, yeah, I'll jump into here. So I've always had a very simple thesis, the value proposition of, of uh, blockchains is really just creating open canvases that other people can program in and something really magical happens when that when that happens like no single web application right now is programmable or uh, other people can come in and program uh, so think any application that has a lot of users where you want those users to not just use the existing api but you want those users to program and build things on top i'm giving you a, a very simple example is a gaming ecosystem a gaming community 
and you want that to be performance isolated from the rest of the network in a way that your community is owned, it has its own uh, uh, hardware ability to, to scale up, and it has its own ability to program and, and govern itself, that's effectively where a sudden is perfect. It's effectively application, uh, uh, sort of like a silent application as a service on the go, elastically coming in and about. Um, and there's so many applications that can come in from uh, loyalty uh, systems to gaming ecosystems to DeFi ecosystems. There's just a lot. Um, and I, I totally see uh, a basically a one-to-one mapping for every single application you can think of that you can develop on a single layer chain. There is almost certainly more uh, than one subnet for that application because there is now more synergies and more things that happen because it's not just an application on a single chain. You now actually have a whole ecosystem of other things developing on top of that. So it's just a, a much bigger Pandora's box type of thing. Beautiful. Um, we have a lot of questions. I'm not sure if we'll be able to get to all of them, but want to want to give a few other you know a few more people a chance to speak. Uh, Fudrick, you've been waiting for a while. Um, I believe you're on stage. Do you want to do you want to ask a question? Oh yeah. First of all, I would just like to say shout out to all of you guys for building this beautiful chain. It's like a Grand Theft Auto sandbox type of chain. I love it. But uh, as far as the subnets go, how many validators would you recommend having for maybe like a small scale, you know, subnet? So this is a great question. And uh, there are all sorts of interesting. Let me, let me very quickly give you a brief recap of, uh, of the research in this area. What you really want to have is a, is a chain, is a subnet that is going to be live at all times uh, in the presence of foreseeable, reasonable failures. Okay, so that is up to you. So you have to decide what your, your chain is doing. You have to decide what your security uh, requirements are, what your liveness requirements are, and then you have to pick these numbers yourself. For the longest time, uh, research in this area, in the distributed systems area, focused on actually discreetly counting these nodes. Okay, so uh, you know, you, some people might have heard of 3F plus 1. So if you anticipate having, let's say, two nodes down at any time, then you should have seven. Okay, that kind of thing. But, uh, but then at some point in the 1990s, people realized, look, you know, sometimes you have a huge number of nodes and they all have, are subject to the same common failure. They're all in the same data center, so they all go down together. So really what we should really think about are the, the conjoined failure probabilities of every pair of nodes. So if your node and my node are likely to exhibit failures at the same time, then, then maybe we need Kevin's node as well, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really, uh, it comes down to the science. Essentially, you know, there's a crap ton of research in this area. It's just, it's very, very extensive. It comes down to an art. Um, if you really want just some numbers, uh, I would say depending on, it all depends on the value secured on the chain. If it's, uh, if it's a game and people are playing it and, and, the li and liveness is not an issue, you can go with a subnet of one, I think, or maybe that might be a basic limitation in the system. There, there might be a minimum limit, maybe it's three. Um, so you can have a smallish subnet, but deep down in my heart, what I would really love everybody to, to think about is if they are thinking of a blockchain solution, they should really think about maximizing the number of validators. Why not go for a million? Set the kind of system up where anybody can join and participate in the upkeep of that, that information, that service, whatever it might be. And, and, and the system, Avalanche, the protocol, gives you the tools to scale to millions of nodes. Take advantage of it. Great answer. Um, I think we just got a free lesson here. So let's bring up um, Avox Chicken. Uh, you've also been waiting for yeah. a while. Appreciate you. Th thank you, Luigi, and thank you, team. This question is for Morgan, and it kind of adds on to what Amro was saying. Morgan, I was trying to understand, like, you said something in the beginning. You said there's a lot of education that you're doing right now. Can you give us an idea, like, what is the, what does the sales cycle look like? Like, who are you bringing in? Are they coming to you with ideas already? Or do they not even know what they're looking for? Are they just kicking the can? And then, like, is it a two-year sales cycle? Um, do they have budget? Do they even have developers? Like, what are you doing to help accelerate that sales cycle? And, like, what does it look like? The short answer to that is yes. 
<laughs> and what I mean by that is there's such a, in speaking with all the different types of kind of financial institutions and, and, and John Nahas probably feels this on the enterprise side as well, there's such a wide variety in talking to these institutions of like crypto nativeness um, all up and down the spectrum. So, and then even within kind of the major buckets, like major banks, uh, asset managers, hedge funds, private equity firms, family offices, even within those buckets, there's such a wide variety of how kind of um, strate strategically important they're making uh, blockchain and digital asset initiatives. So it's kind of nuanced, but it's literally everything from webinars, spaces like this, one-on-ones, deep dives, um, and then really kind of becoming that like trusted advisor to the um you know to the group that's going through with the initiative kind of end to end throughout their exploratory and like execution process so it's a you know to luigi what he was saying earlier it's definitely a longer sales cycle than kind of some of the projects that i think um you know the the chain started out seeing but um more and more i think institutions are starting to kind of strategically prioritize this space and even you know even where we're at, we're at from a macro market perspective and even when we're at from a crypto winter perspective you know institutional interest isn't dying down whatsoever if anything what we're seeing is um the importance of bringing real world assets on chain and real world utility on chain and so i feel like if anything those those efforts and that focus is 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 intact and ramped up so you know I, i'm really excited and um you know i think uh we'll definitely see more to come from the institutional space yeah, I'll just add to that real quick. You know, I, I, Morgan hit the nail on the head, right? This is, and, and Luigi alluded to this earlier. It's not like a DAP that can just be deployed, right? So we're here to support the community, to support the enterprise and the developers. So you could have someone that comes to us and says, we've mapped this thing out. We've built it. This is how we envision it. Can you let us know if, if we're doing this the right way? Because we're ready to go and deploy on testnet or we're ready to get started on building. Then you have the other people that come and say, we don't know what we want to do, but we want to do something. And then it's kind of, you know, do you need a blockchain for this, right? Because at the end of the day, we want to re we want to move forward real use cases here, right? Not just things for the sake of doing things. So you see a spectrum of everybody. A lot of people come to us more than I can even count. And there's people that we've been talking to over the course of six months, a year, a year and a half where they had no Web3 strategy, but we started talking to them and planting seeds with them so that one once they were ready, or if they are ready now, they know to come back to us, right? So our job is not really to chase these people, but to really just be here to support the community and the builders and everybody with kind of the vision for what they want to build. So it's everything under the sun. There's no, there's no simple, simple answer there. But it's exciting. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, we uh, questions are still coming in. I know we're 15 minutes over, so just gonna take a few more real quick. Um, uh, bending vending machine uh yes uh, you want to hop up yep yes sir thank you thank you i just wanted to say what you guys will not say which is how humble you guys are how committed avalabs team is i was at the avalanche creates last week and seeing the avalabs team being there listening to us and creating that space for us to build and to see you guys here today with the community taking questions even with him and being sick that just shows commitment I wanted to just say to you guys, thank you. We appreciate it. It makes us, the builders, the project owners, more bullish on the chain. And I also wanted to, whoever is here, to rally everyone to start talking and promoting more about Avalanche. The best advertisement is word of mouth. And there are a lot of us here, but professionally and you know, elegantly without trolling, let's spread the word. Let's make Avalanche great. Um, thank you, guys. That's it. Thank you. Here, here. Um, that was amazing. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words. That was that was very nice. Uh, let's let's keep it going. Uh, Firestorm, um, why don't you get up here? Hey all, thank you so much for doing this. You know, this type of insight is truly valuable, particularly to folks in the community. Obviously, you know, most of us here are big believers in the technology, right? I think over the last few years, the technology itself truly, you know, it proved itself. I don't think we need to worry about it too much. I'm going to ask a question relating to uh adoption and you know a, a kind of a curveball thing that's been sort of at the back of my mind like i've come across one instance of a company that's actually building a subnet and the you know the original issue was communication between chains 
you solved it, right? You know, no questions there. The second issue ended up being how do we acquire the actual assets to create our nodes and how do we run our nodes? And well, have I have been be, muted. You know, it, oops, sorry. What was that? I have been muted. Can you guys hear me? Everybody can hear me, right? Uh, we can hear the speaker and, and we're hearing someone else as well. Yes. No uh, uh, you guys are listening sorry. to J Reels Films. Okay. Okay, you there's know, some trolling no, going on. Yeah, no no big uh, Twitter space is uh, real space unless there's some trolling. Anyways, continuing <laughs> on the conversation. I'm not going to ask about price, so, so we're good. No more trolling. But anyways, um, acquiring the assets is potentially a challenge for a lot of these enterprises and institutions, right? You know, the reason could be economic. Obviously, you know, where we are today, it's a lot more economic to be able to acquire a certain number of nodes. But obviously, we've seen prices where, you know, there is some serious cost associated with acquiring the nodes and operating them. The second reason could be regulatory, right? Uh, and a lot of these institutions don't really have proper guidance to actually go out to a, I don't know, a Binance or another exchange or an OTC desk to acquire these assets. So how, how are you guys approaching the ability to provide them the nodes that they need to be able to run the subnet that they want to run, right? I don't think this is even a blockchain versus blockchain question. I'm assuming and I, I believe that Avalanche is the actual solution that everybody should truly use. How do we, how do we get these institutions the nodes that they need that are applicable to their specific use case. So I'll, I'll hop in real quick. Um, and then I think a few others can, can uh, piggyback off of what, what I would say. Uh, real quick, you know, one thing that's really cool about Elastic Subnets is uh, this notion that whoever is creating the subnet need not necessarily uh, be the one running the nodes. So for certain use cases, that's, you know, a supremely an effective way of, of handling this issue, right? You have effectively institutional node providers who uh, in a lot of ways just want to validate, right? I said it once that uh, for our, from, from my parents and such uh, running validated nodes was, uh, sorry, for like renting homes was their passive income. And I think for our generation, like, you know, running nodes and, and being in proof of stake will be our, uh, will, will be our passive income. So whether it's, uh, you know, individuals who, who want to run a series of nodes and, and provide this validation service, that's that's supremely possible. And then whether or not there's institutions like a Coinbase or Block Daemon, et cetera, that want to do this, I think that's entirely possible. Uh, Morgan, I don't know if there's something else you want to add. I know you speak to institutions as well, but I do want to also just keep it light because we want to allow for one more question before we, uh, at a minimum, before we, before we have to jump. So uh, I don't know if you have anything else to add. Um, yeah, no, I would I would echo everything that you just said. I think um, that's definitely true as it relates to um, kind of primary network validation. And from a subnet perspective, also, you know, the the beauty of being able to kind of as an institution or enterprise dictate your own token, whether that has economic value like USDC or or not. Um, that's one way that institutions are kind of looking to obfuscate away for their users that they're actually interacting with a blockchain. So that's the only thing I would add, but I would echo everything you said from, um, from like a broader base primary network validation perspective. Great. Let, let's get uh, one more in here. Uh, I know we're way over time. Um, crypto kindergarten. Um, you've been waiting for a long time. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think I caught Emmons cold here as well. But first, I just want to say I uh, appreciate everyone up here. Thank you guys for taking the time. Big believer in the chain. Um, and I, I think it's set up better uh, than anything else to uh, really bring in uh, institutions. Um, on that note, um, and I hope this question isn't just uh, bizarre or, uh, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> or just misinformed, but uh, uh, first, just in, in regards to institutions uh, and in your conversations with them, I was curious if there are, uh, is any pushback from uh, anyone that um, is concerned about uh, a subnet uh, or, you know, or any chain still ultimately kind of relying on uh, the um, security of the primary network. Um, and then in that same vein, you know, if we're talking about down the line and trillions of dollars in, in real world assets up for grabs. Do you foresee the total value of 
you know, hundreds or thousands of subnets getting to a point where the, the primary network, you know, even at a, a 70% attack uh, um, is something that could be theoretically um, profitable. Uh, and I know that's, that's kind of a, a crazy question to ask, but um, just in regards to, uh, um, you know, the, the total value of subnets, and um, the concern of the primary network being the parent of those. Um, I, I can jump in here with some thoughts um, and then feel free anybody else to jump in. But I think generally speaking, uh, this first and foremost is a great question. Um, and it's a question that I think um, as a builder of, uh, of infrastructure keeps me up at night at least. And it's not just me, it's actually everybody else for any other ecosystem, Cosmos and Solana and Ethereum, uh, when you build these systems, you end up um, allowing totally for the possibility of these exogenous events to occur that are completely not modeled by your set of assumptions that you have, right? We have a set of assumptions that is that, you know, there is going to be a certain amount of uh, a stake that is going to be honest and it's going to behave properly and it's not going to do anything fancy and crazy. Um, but of course, when you have something as, as, you know, open canvas as avalanche and, uh, and anybody can develop anything on it, then these exogenous models of, you know, there is applications that are on another subnet that are extremely valuable. And yet the underlying, uh, uh, chain does not reflect the security of the value being on top of it. These can totally happen and they're not modelable as far as I know, there is not, there's no way to model them with the current set of tooling. So it's something that keeps me up at night. It's something that we have to, as a space, always worry about. Um, but I've always viewed this as a um, as a dynamic event or, or as a dynamic process, rather, wherein I think that um, while it is possible for these kinds of events to happen, they typically, uh, at least probabilistically, should not happen only because the value of something is really tied to, rather, so the security of something is really tied ultimately to a certain extent to the to the value that is being built on top. I, I don't see how you can have a permissionless set network where anybody can join and validate and there, yet uh, it has both very low number of validators and a very large number uh, of a very large amount of value built on top of it. Uh, surely that must only happen with a permissioned network in which case there is control set up for it and so on. So it's, it's a roundabout way of saying that I, I think this is kind of one of those things that te at least empirically seems to solve for itself. Uh, but there is nobody in the space that has a good answer to, to what happens when these kinds of exogenous events ca can happen. And it's really something that we should really all be aware of and constantly take a look. And, and, you know, I've seen bridges that are, that have incredible value being built on top of them with only a few validators and they're just totally open for attack. So these things can happen and we have to be wary as, a, as, a, as builders in the space. Amazing. Um, I think we are almost a half hour over. Um, I think I think this was, you know, incredibly insightful and also very helpful. I enjoyed it very much and hope everybody else did. Um, I don't know if anybody here has some closing thoughts if they wanted to, to shoot out, but in general, uh, really appreciate everybody coming to listen. Um, uh, I think we'll find out, but I believe it'll be recorded. Uh, don't hold me to that, but if not, um, you know, maybe we could work that out, but hopefully we can have more of these going forward and, and, and invite different guests and whatnot. So excited about all this going forward. Appreciate the opportunities. Anybody have any closing thoughts? Uh, any of the speakers real quick before we hop off? Many thanks to everyone who joined us tonight. Yeah, it's, right. it's really just following up. Uh, I know that not everybody could make it to the creates event last week, but if the online community is indicative of, uh, uh, at least a sample of the people that were, were showing up. It's just incredible. Uh, just many, many smarter people than me in this in this ecosystem, and it's just really incredible to see. So uh, thank you all for, uh, for building here. Awesome, guys. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for your time, and, and uh, send us some tweets, and uh, we'll, get, we'll continue the discussion online. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Cheers. Thanks, all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.